Hey uh, everyone, I'm Sina. This is going to be a workshop, so I will be working with the terminal. I will show you some code and uh, show you how to use guess, uh, like guess tracing feature. That's why we specifically needed my laptop. Uh, so yeah, sorry uh, for, for having to wait. Um, also, yeah, because I will be uh, showing code, it would be great if you guys could come forward if you want to see uh, what's happening, because I imagine the fonts will be small. So yeah, I'm going to give you a bit of time to come forward. And uh, while uh, you're doing that, uh, I want to talk a bit, uh, something a bit personal. Uh, so I come from Iran. I don't know if you heard, but there's some stuff happening there. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the people uh, who are going to the streets there. They're protesting for their uh, civil liberties, uh, for freedom of speech. Um, so yeah, there's been three weeks of protest uh, now. Uh, internet has been disconnected. Um, and it all started when uh, the girl on the left, who is uh, 22 years old, uh, was uh, in custody because of showing a bit of hair and uh, she somehow uh, happened to die in custody. And this outraged people uh, who went on the streets. And uh, during this protest, uh, close to 200 people have died, uh, among them uh, Nika, uh, who was 16 years old, and by, like, when running away from the police, uh, uh, she also died. So, yeah, just want to give a quick shout out to them. Uh, they're risking their lives. Uh, asking for their rights and for, for freedom. But this is a technical topic and I don't want to waste your time anymore. So let's get uh, straight to it. So what is uh, tracing? Why would you need tracing? Um, I just want to show you uh, an example of... This is Etherscan. Uh, you, everybody knows Etherscan, right? And the internal t uh, transaction section of Etherscan is basically uh, a trace of that transaction. It shows you what happened within that transaction. Every call that happened there, uh, who called who, and, and so on. And this was, uh, this was actually probably not from a guest node, but I'm guessing from Open Ethereum or Ergon. But we have, a very, uh, we have a similar feature to this. And this is not the only use case. Um, there's many of them, just to name a few, like I, just, just before coming here, I was talking to somebody who's developing a ZK EVM, who are also heavily uh, dependent on the tracing feature of Geth. Uh, I've seen uh, talks uh, about uh, from MEV searchers who are using the tracing features, and many more. Yeah, this is also another tab in the Etherscan uh, the details where it shows you the, the state, like the state difference. Uh, we also have, as we will see later, this is also something that you can get from Geth. So before we get to, in, actually, we get into tracing, um, you know that you can use Geth to execute a call uh, on top of uh, a given state. So you probably know ETH call. Uh, you give it a set of parameters, like as if it would be a as if you want to send a transaction to the network, but this is actually not sent to the network. It's just executed locally, and you see the result. Uh, it's a simulation. Uh, I, actually, you have to give me a bit of time, because <laughs> I had to restart my laptop, and I lost all my setup. I, I have to bring up the terminal, because I wanted to show you how this actually goes. So yeah, I have a, I have a girly note on my machine that is a kind of thing to uh, to the network. Uh, okay, yeah. Is it behind me? Yeah, maybe I move it here. All right, so um, let's do a, a call. Wait, I have them all stored in a file, so I don't have to type it out because... Anyway, I'm, I'm losing too much on time on this, so I'm just going to go. I already lost a lot of time. Um, you all know how it's call goes, okay? Let's move on to the next one. Um, 
I'm just going to explain to you. So basically, uh, this uh, the I'm sending um, I'm sending like I'm simulating a call to the, the wrapped ETH uh, contract on Gurley uh, to get the balance of of an account of account zero, right? Um, this will only give you the result. Like in this case, the result is uh, zero. Like it shouldn't be. Uh, I have to figure this out. Like I think I, I have the wrong address here. Um, like the, the, this address, the, uh, the zero address should have some balance. But anyway, what I, what I wanted to show is that when you when you uh, do an ETH call, you only get the execution result, what is returned from the contract back. But this is oftentimes not enough information. We want usually more information. We want to see what happened inside the transaction, right? And that you can do by doing the same thing, but using a debug method, trace call, um, which will simulate the call for you uh, and trace it at the same time. It would give you more information. So if I were to run this now, I think this is the mainnet contract. I was using, um, I was going to present with um, mainnet node, but then I found out the Wi-Fi here is not so good, so I can't SSH to my server. Uh, here we can already see that there is a lot more information. Um, as uh, it basically shows you all the steps that happen during the execution of this transaction. Um, yeah, there, there's going to be a lot of steps. Uh, I'm not going to go to uh, show you all of them. But basically, you, you will see, OK, uh, like what is the first opcode? What is the um, programming counter at that point? Which opcode was executed? How much gas do we have at this point? Uh, like what is the storage at this point? And so on. So it will give you almost uh, the full information that the EVM has uh, uh, when it runs uh, through the transaction. You can ask questions, sure. Uh, the stack is before the instruction, yeah. So all of these information are from before we execute the opcode. Um, here I showed you, in this example, I showed you like tracing a call of my own craft. Like basically I said, okay, I want to like do from to input and so on. Um, but of course, uh, guest supports tracing existing transactions, the one that were already mined on the chain. Um, so historical transactions, so to say. Uh, th those you can do via these endpoints. You have a debug trace transaction that uh, traces a historical transaction. You just give it a, a, a TX hash. Uh, you can also do it at the block level. You can trace a block by using trace block by number or a hash. Or you can do even uh, a whole range of blocks by using a trace chain. Uh, but trace chain, mind you, is a bit different. It's not a simple, like, uh, it's not using the simple JSON RPC uh, request. You have to, it's a bit, uh, based on the subscription API, so you have to use WebSocket for it. So the usage of it is a bit different. I'm not going to show you here, um, but uh, yeah, it's cool for when you need to run over a range of uh, blocks. What, what we saw in, in the previous trace was the default tracer. It's basically the opcode tracer. Like it shows you every step. But sometimes you need uh, information at a different abstraction level. Like for example, as we saw in the Etherscan uh, screenshot, you want to see uh, what calls happen, or like you, you want to get different information. And Geth has a bunch of built in tracers that uh, you can just call them by name and, uh, and get the information you want. So here, like in this section, I want to show you uh, three of them. The first one being the one that we saw. I'm just going to, like, here in this table, you, you will see all the in information that you will get from the opcode tracer, um, which is, yeah, I'm going to give you a second uh, if you want to uh, see what's in there. But yeah, basically, you get the opcode information 
all the gas related information like how much this upcode costs to execute uh, or will cost to execute, how much gas there's left, the, the whole memory snapshot uh, of that transaction, uh, the, the stack uh, return data of the last call, like when a call finishes, uh, in the next step you will get the return data for it, uh, storages for the storage slots for the contract, depth of the execution, refund, and if there was any error. But please note that if you want to use uh, this tracer, there are some things to note. As I said, memory, stack, uh, storage, and return data, th these are dynamic values, and they can grow large, especially uh, memory. You have to watch out for memory, because uh, mainnet transactions these days are very heavy. Uh, so like, if you have memory enabled, uh, it can uh, kill the node, basically. Uh, like, yeah, somebody, report, one of our users reported that they tried to trace a block with, uh, on a server with uh, 64 gigabytes of memory and uh, it crashed, basically. But because of this, um, the, the tracer accepts options to disable all these features. So all, all of the ones that you will see in this list, they can be disabled. Some of them are enabled by default, some are not, but they're all like, uh, you can toggle all of them. Also, if you, if you really need to trace, uh, uh, you, you need a memory, let's say, and JSON RPC is not sufficient for it, and you control the node, then there's an endpoint standard trace block to file, which will trace a block and save it on a file alongside the node that you can, uh, yeah, you can easily access. So it's not a, like a JSON RPC request. Uh, the next one is the call tracer. This is arguably one of the more, uh, like, most interesting tracers. Uh, it will basically give you all the call information, like all the internal calls that happened uh, during the execution. Uh, I'm going to show you in, in the previous example, like, like uh, basically when we call wrapped ether balance of uh, what information we will get in return. So you can see um, that like, balance off is a simple call. It's not going to call anything else. And there's, there's one call. It shows you who is the sender, uh, who is the recipient, who is the contract. What is it call or is it create? Uh, was there any value transfer? And what was the call data? What was the input? But yeah, this is a more like boring example. We can... Um, I hope these transaction hashes are okay. I feel like the file wasn't saved. Yeah, okay, it works. Um, so I'm just gonna run it, uh, sh so show you guys. Uh, so here I'm, I'm trying, like I'm not doing trace call, but I'm using a historical transaction that was mined on Gurley. So I'm using trace transaction endpoint. And this is the transaction hash. And here, like as an option, you can specify you can specify what, which tracer you want to use. So if you don't provide anything, then it will default to the opcode tracer. But you can say, I want to use the call tracer, as we did here. And you will get a bunch of information. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is going to be the main call. And notice that we can already see like, this call uh, errored, like there, it reverted. We can also see, from, since recently, we can see the revert reason which is system time out, uh, outdated. This is the solidity uh, revert error that was returned, the input output. And then here, from here, we have the nested calls. So basically, the, the, the main contract did some uh, called another one uh, that we can see here, which, which also reverted. And like up there, you can see like there is um, there's more uh, nested calls but that it's not being displayed here, but you can, you can get that information also. So yeah, call, uh, call tracer you would use when you need uh, information about the internal calls. Um, it also, since recently, it accepts a nifty option. So I'm going to provide here. Like a, you, can, you can basically configure the tracers. You can say, like, I want only top call. Um, 
This is, this is useful if you need only the top call information, like only if you want to know, okay, why did this transaction revert, then I don't need to see all the nested call information. I just get the top call and I check the revert reason and I know, okay, there was a time outdated or something. This one is a pre-state tracer. It has two modes of execution. By default, when you just, you, you just say, I want to ex like trace this with the pre-state tracer, then it will give you all the accounts that are needed to execute uh, the call or the transaction. Um, you can think of it as uh, something similar to access lists or witnesses. Uh, so if you somehow need to uh, simulate a transaction and don't uh, store the whole state, uh, you can get the state via the pre-state tracer, um, and then you can execute your transaction locally. And in, in the second mode, uh, you can see all the state, mo uh, state modifications that happen during, during the tra transaction. Basically, you can, say, you can see, okay, the balance of this account increased to such value, the, the storage slots changed such and such. If, if we were to see it in, see it live, it's this one. So here I'm, um, oh, I need to change the address. I'm gonna execute the same wrapped ether balance of call and pass uh, the to see the pre-state. And yeah, as you can see, like the zero address has, like shows the balance of the zero address. This is the, the contract itself, has a balance, the code, uh, nonce, and like the, all the storage slots that were needed to execute these transactions. These are not all the storage slots of this contract, but only those that were required here. And let's say you wanted to see the, the diff, you just pass a parameter diff mode and yeah, basically we can see like the biggest change here is that the nonce, so you have like a pre and post uh, state and you, you have to compare them. So you can see here, like we have the zero address. The nonce is omitted because it's zero. So nonce was zero and now it's one. So this is the only, uh, the only change that happened in the state during this transaction. But of course, if we were to run it with a more complicated transaction, you would see, yeah, you would see like there's gonna be much more stuff. This is, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and this is what parts of the state that changed during this particular transaction. Like here we had also balance updates uh, yeah, nonce and balance both changed, and balance of zero account changed. And yeah, here we have like, um, the, f the format works as follows. Basically, whenever something is created, let's say a contract is created, it will not show up in the pre-object, it will only show in the post-object. And whenever something is deleted, it will only show up in the pre-object, but not in the post-object. So by, by comparing these two objects, you can, you can see um, how, the, how the state was modified. Uh, so now I want to uh, talk a bit about how Geth stores state, because it is very relevant when you're doing tracing. Like if you've been, tra been tracing, you probably saw this error, required historical state unavailable. Specifically when you want to trace a historical transaction, one that was mined. Uh, now, now why is this? So, first of all, um, how do we prepare the state uh, for simulating a transaction or rerunning a transaction? It's basically like you have to, we have to find, okay, the transaction in block N, so we need, we will fetch the state for block n minus one, the post state of block mi n minus one, um, and start executing all of the transactions within the target block until we reach the transaction that we want. At this point, we have the transaction, we have the state uh, 
the pre-state basically for our transaction and we can, we can execute it. But what happens if the state for this block n minus one is not available in the database? Uh, basically that's hint, that's what, uh, when you get this error. Uh, so what, uh, so now comes the question, the state for which blocks are actually persisted? Um, let's get the archive node out of the picture because it's the easiest. So for archive node, you have all the states. Next one is full sync. Uh, by full sync, I specifically mean that you start executing all of the blocks from Genesis up until the head. Here, um, it's worth to note that always uh, Geth stores the latest 128 blocks, uh, the, the state for them, in memory. So you always have, like, while your node is syncing, you always have the state for the last 128 blocks. Now, anything beyond that um, is stored, on, like, is persisted to this only periodically. Uh, and that is roughly every two hours. So every two hours, um, the state for a block will be persisted to disk. And because we synced from Genesis, that means we have the state of a block roughly every two hours from Genesis on until the more recent ones. And the difference bet between full sync and snap sync is that in SnapSync, you won't actually start, you won't actually execute the transaction, you won't actually execute the blocks from the beginning, but from some pivot point. So let's say here is the point when you um, start, like you fetch the state from the, from the network and you start executing transactions. So that's why we only have the checkpoints from this point on. And like, so, we basically we cannot execute any transaction that that happened before we we did the snap sync. So it's important to know, like based on your use case, um, which sync mode you should go for. And now we can complete the picture again. So how do we prepare the state for for executing a transaction? We fetch the state of the parent block from the database. If it's not available, what do we do? Guess we'll go back in the blocks for, for a number of blocks and check if it has the state available for any of them uh, in, on disk. And if so, then it will basically re-execute all of those blocks and prepare the state for your transaction. So here you can see in the error, we have, we have the error and we have some more information, like re-exec equals 128. This means that guess tried the 100, went 128 blocks uh, backwards to find some state on disk that it could use to, to go forward, but it didn't find any. And this is a this is a um, this is a parameter that you can give. So basically, when when you do trace transaction, you can provide this re-exec parameter and say, okay, I'm willing to go back 2,000 or 2 million blocks to find a state that I can use to uh, to execute uh, this this transaction. But of course, the more you're willing to go, the more you go back the longer it's going to take because all of those blocks have to be re-executed to, to compute the state. We have a, a, there's, a, there's a method that you can use to see states for which blocks are actually stored on disk. And that's debug get accessible state. So let's say like I want to see, I want to see like 5,000 5, blocks behind the head do I have any, any state there? Computing, no state found. So I don't have anything between the last 5,000 and 4,000 blocks. Okay, I, I can try again, or I can enlarge the, the search parameters. 
it's probably also going to say no. Oh, actually, no. It found it. So here it says, like, I have, there's this block that I have the state for. Uh, so I know that uh, block number. Yeah, so I know that I have the state for like 8,000 blocks ago, basically. So yeah, this is this is a, a nifty method for finding um, which which states you have on your disk. And then when when you when you know this, then you can set the re-exec parameter accordingly. And sometimes uh, there is a range of blocks that you care about a lot, like you, you need a lot, so you want to store the whole state for that. What you can do is basically stop guess, add this parameter, GC mode archive, and, and run for as long as you need, and then stop it again and take it off. Because when this flag is there, then guess will store every state, like the, the state for every block uh, on disk. We went over the, some of the tracers that, are, that come as like in, in stock guess, but that's not your only option. You can also, um, you, can, you can write a custom tracer, like you can basically uh, guess, like we, there's some hooks uh, that, that you can use uh, to collect the relevant information for your use case, and only that. You don't have to rely on the, the uh, tracers that we provide. And here I want to show you an example. I, um, during DevConnect in Amsterdam, I, I met this guy who was an MEV searcher, and he was telling me that he found the tracing feature of Geth extremely useful. And then later on, I uh, saw his talk, and he was talking about this. So uh, apparently, there, is, uh, there are some poisonous tokens out there, or they used to be at some point, that, uh, that wrecked, uh, basically, uh, searchers, like the automatic bots. And uh, one of, one of the, those uh, tokens kind of looks like this. this is, I think this is a simple one. It's not a real, real one. But basically, it just checks uh, to see if you are in a development environment, then it uh, does the, the actual transfer uh, of value. But once you, so let's say you simulate that uh, in, on hard hat, and you see like, yeah, I got some money. But when you run it on mainnet, then you actually don't get that money, and you probably lose some. Uh, so that's the, that's the gist of the token. And like he, he wrote a like demonstrated a simple tracer that can detect this, uh, and I'm gonna show you that. This is how a custom JavaScript tracer looks like. It's a it's a very simple one. You have a few methods that you can implement in a JavaScript object, and you will pass this object to get. Uh, when you when you invoke the uh, the API, in this case, we implement the step method, which is run for every uh, step of the execution, and we implement also the result function, which is executed once at the end of the transaction. So basically, we want to the the idea of of the de detection al algorithm <laughs> is that. Uh, token transfer shouldn't use any of the following opcodes. Coinbase, number, difficulty, origin. These are all block metadata, right? Why, when you're doing a ERC20 transfer, why would you need any of these opcodes? So this is like a very simple detection thing. So what, what I'm doing is basically like I have a global variable called fishy and as I'm going through the opcode, as I'm going through the steps, I check that if any of these opcodes appear, then I'm gonna say, okay, there's smoke coming out of this. I don't want to do this straight. So I just set that variable to true and return it. And now, like here is my. I you can't see that, but basically the result is true. So what? what 
So I, uh, I, I run that tracer over a contract, uh, and the, the result was true. But uh, let's, let's dive. This is, this is probably the most part, interesting part of the. There is a few things here, right? So I'm, I'm, simulating, I'm simu simulating a call uh, f from and to, to an address. Uh, but note that this address is actually not, um, is empty. There's no, uh, like, there's no contract deployed on Gurley for this address. Uh, so I'm going to introduce to you an, a very nifty feature, and that's called state overrides. Right? Um, basically, when, when, you, when you simulate a call using eth.call or uh, debug.trace.call, you can give a bunch of state modifications to, to guess, like temporary, and you say, okay, apply these state overrides temporarily for simulating this transaction. So here, what I did was I, I, I have the bytecode of, of the contract, the poisonous token. This is the bytecode. And here I say, okay, state overrides, in this address, please put this contract code. So this contract code will, will not be deployed anywhere, but only when I'm simulating this transaction, it will be as if this address has this code. Uh, so this is very useful like if you're uh, simulating stuff. And, and the, the tracer object I'm passing also separately here. So what happens is basically, yeah, there's a call to transfer to this contract, and uh, my custom tracer detects, like says that it's a, it's a fishy call because it uses the Coinbase opcode. Now, the, the JavaScript tracer is, um, is what most of people know about, but it's not the only option for writing a custom tracer. Since a while ago, we also have another option. Namely, you can write your tracers in Go. Um, this is especially relevant if performance is, is a concern to you. Uh, the, the Go JavaScript overhead is a lot. So when, when you want to do tracing over a long range of blocks, and it just takes a long time. But now you can actually write your tracers in Go. Um, and it's pretty simple how it works. I have, I have one here that I'm going like, to uh, walk through a bit. But I just want to show you how you can, first I want to show you how you can write one. So basically, you write your tracer. Um, you add this. This is a very important part. This is how it, how guests will know that there is a tracer here to be found. And you drop this file in a directory in guest. So we have this directory, is tracers native. You simply have to drop your Go file here, do the registration, and you're good to go. And of course, your, your struct has to adhere to an interface. And this is the interface that you will see. So the methods are capture start. This is at the, at the beginning of, of the execution. Uh, you have capture state, which is run for every, every step of execution. You have enter. Uh, we didn't see this before. Uh, enter is basically a hook that is, uh, that is called every time we enter a new call frame. So when there's a call or a create, we enter a new call frame, this, uh, this one is called. And exit is when we leave the, the call frame. And you have fault uh, and, and the result. So, so the result is when basically the, what you return uh, and what the tracer will return when you call the method. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's a bit uh, tight time-wise, but I'm just going to give a short overview. So <clears throat> uh, what this tracer does is that it will tell me the method signature for all of the, uh, all of the functions that were called. So as you, as you probably know, uh, solidity functions, like when you hash their signatures, the four bytes, that's how you actually invoke them at the EVM level, right? So like when you, when you um, 
And I, I want to just collect uh, the, this, this four bytes, basically, like the signature of the methods that were called. So this is the gist of the logic. Uh, I check that we're, we're entering a new call frame. Uh, I check that is this, uh, it has to be a call or a delegate call or a static call, some kind of call. Otherwise, just return. That's not important. Also, we don't want to collect pre-compiled information, so they're also returned. If in, otherwise, take the four, first four bytes of the call data, and this will be my signature. And this, these are stored in some object here. Uh, yeah, I don't have more time to go through this. So that's how you write a Go tracer. And I want to quickly mention uh, what's coming next uh, on this front. Um, so you saw the trace call method. I'm planning to work on the trace multi-call. This is when you will have a list of call objects. They will be executed sequentially, maintaining the intermediate state as they go to the next call. And uh, the other thing is the trace namespace, or as other people refer to it as parity tracing. So uh, these are the things on the roadmap that are being uh, worked on right now. And on the last seconds, that was, uh, that was it, basically. Thank you, guys. Hi. Most of these will probably be available in the docs, but um, does trace to file exist for transactions only rather than just blocks? Uh, no, it's, I think what we have is only for blocks now. Got it. Uh, is reexec re -exec available via JSON RPC? Yeah. So I didn't show it, but basically when you do trace transaction, in the same object that you provide the tracer name, you, s you specify reexec. Got it. And does get accessible state return only the highest block number that has state or all block it numbers? It will return, like in the range that you specify, it will return the first state that it finds. The first, so the, the earliest. First one. So if you want to get the, all of them, then you have to iterate. You have to narrow your range as you go and... So if I did Genesis to now? If you need Genesis to now, then it will give you the first one, like let's say it's block 10, and then you do another call from block 10 until now and so on. Hey, um, quick question on the, um, the state diff tracer. So um, does it provide a kind of, you know, if there are multiple state changes in a transaction, like at, at the call level, do you provide all of those state changes or is it just from the beginning to the end of the transaction? What is the state diff? I may have missed this. Oh, it's, yeah, it's only from, like, basically throughout the whole transaction. Okay. Not, you mean for call level? Yes. Ah, uh, you want the state diff for call yeah. level? No, no, uh, no. It's only for whole tra transaction. But this is something, a custom tracer? But yeah, you can, you can yeah, definitely yeah. do that. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cool. can just check the code for the pre trace tracer. It's, yeah. it's in the same directory that I showed. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it will be very hard to do. Yeah. But thanks so much. Thank you.